welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Madeline. And I'm Andrea. And this is episode 126. For new viewers, we are a mother and daughter team and Fruity Knitting is a 90 minute program that brings you knitting inspiration from around the world as well as extra snippets of travel, history and storytelling that we hope adds joy to your life and brings a smile to your face. Yes, and there's quite a large segment on travel and storytelling in today's episode because we've recently returned from our trip to Prince Edward Island in Canada. So just to recap for any new viewers, the Prince Edward Island Fibre Festival paid our travel expenses so we could attend and cover their festival. But unfortunately, due to Hurricane Fiona, the festival was cancelled and mm. therefore most of the interviews and activities that we'd spent many hours preparing to film for you were also cancelled. And this was really heartbreaking for all the people involved, especially because the festival had already been cancelled twice before due to the pandemic. Mm. But Islanders are tough and they don't give up easily and they're already planning to make the festival even better next year. Outside of the hurricane season. Yes. <laughs> no, I think in the same season because it's a beautiful time to visit Prince Edward Island. And since Madeline and I were on the island before the festival was cancelled and the hurricane hit, we decided to stay anyway and showcase Prince Edward Island and some of the things it has to offer fibre lovers and crafters by coming up with a new set of interviews and content. And we had some good help to organise this and I think we've done really well. So included in today's program is our special feature on Prince Edward Island, which includes three mini interviews with two woolen mills and an alpaca farmer. We also take you to the Anne of Green Gables Museum and we show you lots of spectacular scenery from all around the island. And then for our main interview, we're featuring the award-winning, best-selling co-authors of the Salt Water uh, Knitting Series, Christine Legros and Shirley Scott. Now, Christine and Shirley have been unearthing, preserving and recreating traditional knitting patterns and techniques that Newfoundland knitters have long been practicing. There are four books in the award-winning series. We have three of them right here. Yeah. And I think you're going to find Christine and Shirley to be terrific fun, real salt of the earth kind of ladies. And the interview will give you a good taste of Newfoundland Island culture. So I think our program is truly an Atlantic Canadian program. Yeah. And mum and I also have updates on our knitting projects to share. And I have brought back quite a lot of yarn for new exciting projects, which I want to show you. And also through our discussions with people we met in Canada, I realised that many of our viewers aren't aware of the additional resources we offer and therefore don't use them. So I've made a very short presentation to help you navigate our website and find the information that you're looking for. And that's all included in today's program and in the description box below you'll find the timestamps for each segment in our program. Now I'm sure you've been admiring mum's beautiful jumper here, so we're going to start with mum in under construction. Yes, now even though I am wearing this stunning jumper, it does belong in under construction and not bring and brag because it's not quite finished. As you can see with the attached knitting needles here, I still have the very last part of the second sleeves cuff to finish. Yeah. But I just couldn't resist wearing it and showing it off to you because it is utterly stunning. So I, st I started this bow stickening design in July last year. It's by Hirsten Olsen, who was one of the principal bow stickening designers in the 50s and 60s in Sweden. And I think she still is alive and knitting and living in Gothenburg, which is on the west coast of Sweden. So the design is called the Wild Apple. And the yoke uses 14 different colours, 10 of which are different shades of green. And as you know, I really appreciate that. So let me show you again a really close-up picture of the yoke. So as I've said in the past, the design is also called the masterpiece because it uses up to four colours in a row, whereas traditional ferrule uses only two colours per row. I haven't been too phased by that because there are only around four or five such rows, but most of the other rows do use three colours per row, so the knitting is slower than normal. There's also the typical boho stickening pearl stitches, which you should be able to see quite clearly in the photo. The pearl stitches bring a little bit of colour in the row below 
up into the new color on the row above and this makes the colors bleed or melt into each other more and you can see this effect particularly well when you view the pattern from a distance and not so close up as I'm showing you now. I also want to point out the raglan shaping underneath the yoke. This gives extra shaping to the design because it removes the loose flap of material that you can often find just above the armholes in yoke jumpers that don't include this raglan shaping. So most boa stickening designs are knitted top down starting with the yoke and I finished my yoke last year and I just found it so pleasurable and exciting to knit such an inspiring pattern. I could actually spend all my time just knitting boa stickening yokes, they're so beautiful. And then the garment had a long hiatus because the rest of it's in stocking stitch at a really fine gauge. So I knitted the body on 2.2 millimeter needles and the cuff on two millimeter needles. And you can see here, this is my only pair of two millimeter needles and they're old. You can see someone has sit, uh, sat on that. I think Not me. It, probably me. <laughs> and bent it, but it still works. And I just rarely use two millimeter needles that I haven't bought myself another pair. Yeah. So, oh, what can I say? It's, uh, it's definitely the finest gauge I've ever knitted at. And I think it looks quite machine knit, don't you? It's beautiful. It was a lot of work. Mum had to unpick it a lot of times, but I think it was worth it. I did, I did. I'll <laughs> tell you about that in just a minute. But first of all, I did make some minor modifications. So I want it, because I wanted it to look more stylized vintage. So I made it more fitted and that meant I had to take out some pattern repeats in the yoke and that of course changed all my stitch counts for the body and the sleeve. And the pat the boho stickening design is actually knitted with the, the yoke in the round and then you knit the sleeve in pieces back and forth and the body in the front in pieces and seam the sides. But I actually just did the body in the round and the, the sleeves in the round. I also made it shorter and I gave it a 10 centimeter long hem, which is a really good vintage look. And getting back to what Madeline said, I, I did most of the hem and the sleeves when we were in Prince Edward Island. And after the hurricane hit us, we were 14 days without power and electricity. So it was getting dark very early and we were going to bed about 7.30 or eight o'clock which I think the last time I went to bed at 7.30 was when I was six, regularly. I think I was 10. I don't think so. I don't think we were that strict. <laughs> anyway, a couple of nights I did try to knit in dim light, and then the next day I saw that I didn't align my knit stitches and purl stitches in the ribbing, and I turned great chunks of the ribbing into moss stitch, and of course I had to unpick all of that and redo it. And that was particularly painful. Yeah, you spent a whole car drive down to Nova Scotia doing that. Yeah, down to Nova Scotia. And back again. And back again, yeah. just unpicking and re-knitting the, the ribbing. Yeah. So in the design, you have the option of knitting either a folded neck edge or a ribbed neck edge. And I chose the folded neck edge because I thought it would look more elegant. Because this is definitely an heirloom jumper and it's, it's my most refined garment. So before I show you how I did the neck edge, I just want to say that Madeline and I had quite a few discussions about how she would inherit this and how I need to do the sleeves longer. But I've actually made them perfect for me and we've got enough yarn left over so that when you do inherit it, you're yep. very free to unpick and knit them as long as you like because that's the great thing about knitting it to um, top down is that you can just unpick the cast off edge and keep knitting. Well, it means we really can't throw away those scraps. We won't, believe Good. me, we won't. Okay, so now let me show you how I did the folded neck edge. I knitted in stocking stitch for about one centimeter before doing a purl row. And the purl row creates a really good crisp folding line for when the stocking stitch section is sewn down as the facing behind. And after carefully pinning the facing down on the inside of the neck, I hand sewed it down with a whip stitch. And that's what you're seeing me do now. And I'm really pleased with the result. I think it's elegant and it really fits in with the vintage look that I wanted. So when I completely finish the design, which is probably going to be tomorrow, and I block it, I'm going to do a little fashion film so that the garment can be seen in its full glory, which it really deserves to be. And I just want to remind you that if you 
are really impressed with the sheer beauty of boa stickning designs and their gorgeous yokes that we did a boa stickning feature interview back in episode 112. And we've also had a boa stickning knit along going on for the last year in our Fruity Knitting Ravelry group and the Fruity Knitting Patron Community Forum. So some beautiful designs have been knitted there as well. So you might want to go and check them out. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Now it's my turn with a quick bring and brag segment. Last episode, I showed you the Lake Reed hat by Azita Krebs, which I knitted in Rowan's Pebble Island colorway Stanley, as you see right here. So at the time, uh, same time, I was also knitting a second hat um, in the same design, but for mum, using this beautiful green shade called Tussock. Now, as you can see, I've finished it. I've woven in the ends and it's been blocked. And this pattern only comes in one size, but you can easily adapt the size by either changing the yarn weight or the number of pattern repeats. And I've actually done both. So we changed the yarn weight to a worsted weight instead of a DK. And a mum wanted her hat a bit shorter than the first one, which as you can see, has turned out quite big. Go on the side. Uh, it is slightly on the big side, yeah. Um, so I decided to only knit four pattern repeats instead of five before I started the decreases on the crown of the hat. Um, before we blocked it, we were quite concerned that it would be too short. I think it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect for you. Go on the side. Yeah. But mum would like it slightly longer, ideally. The thing is that if I wear a hat without my hair back, it's mm. perfectly fine. But as soon as I've got a clip there, my head's that much bigger. Yeah. So we do have a little bit more yarn. So either you keep it or we can unpick it and put an extra pattern repeat in and, and maybe I'll do it. Oh, uh, look, I think <laughs> I'll fix it up because this colour really goes with mum's eyes. So It suits hat, you too, but I would really love you. it. <laughs> Anyway, next I want to show you all the yarn that I brought back from Prince Edward Island. So I'm just going to go and get that yarn. So here's the yarn. Um, it's quite excessive, <laughs> but it's all gorgeous. Um, and I'm embarrassed that most of it's for me. But I am sharing because either I'll be knitting garments for myself or mum's going to get knit garments for me. Yeah, actually I have enough garments myself, so I'm quite happy to knit you a, a jumper. I'm very grateful to you. Yep. So I'll start in order of acquisition. I did a mini interview with the yarn dyes from Cabin Boy Knits, which you will see in a future episode, and they kindly gifted me this yarn here. It's a two-ply DK weight yarn blended with Massam and Blue-Faced Leicester fleeces, and this was meant to be their new release for the Prince Edward Island Fibre Festival. So they dyed it with Madder Root to give it this sort of reddy colour, and that's meant to symbolise the red sand beaches on Prince Edward Island. I think I'll knit myself a cabled cardigan with this design, but I still have to pick the pattern. Okay. Yeah, so, so that's my first stash of yarn. I don't know yet which stash of yarn I'm allowed to knit up. <laughs> okay, the second one? Yes, this is the second stash. Um, so this yarn is from the McCoslin's Woolen Mill, which you will see very soon in our upcoming feature on Prince Edward Island. And McCoslin's is a sixth generation family business. And when you enter the mill, it feels like you've walked straight into a Dickens novel, but in a good way because there's no child labour. Yeah. <laughs> um, but their factory just has beautiful wooden floorboards yeah. and still uses some machinery that dates back to 1910. So it's a really special thing to be able to go there in person and yeah. see the factory at work. Yeah. Um, it's also the only uh, woolen mill in Atlantic Canada to still produce 100% pure virgin wool blankets. And we were thrilled to have four of these blankets with us in our Airbnb after Hurricane Fiona hit and left our street without power and therefore without heating for two weeks. Like it it got pretty cold. In yeah. fact, actually the house, the house we were in, because it was an old house, ended up being colder inside yeah, than, than outside. outside. Yeah. Yeah. So while we were working... I had a blanket wrapped around me and my big yeah. coat on and a hat on and a yeah. scarf on. <laughs> yeah. But we were given this one as a get, gift and I've had it on my bed and I can't believe how warm a pure wool blanket is. It is so, so nice. warm. Yeah. I can totally recommend them and it's just a lovely shade of green. And it's very soft and fluffy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. okay, but back to the yarn. The yarn is a rustic Aran weight yarn. Uh, it's dyed in the fleece, so it's heathered, and I really love the little colours that shine through. Mm. And I'm going to knit myself a very rugged, rusty um, hiking jacket with it. Yeah. So you might remember a few years ago I designed this 
hiking jacket for me. It's made out of I love it. Jameson's and Smith's Aran weight. It's very bright or it's got yeah. a little bit of, it actually needs a wash. And you like the zipper, don't you? Yes, I love the colour. I think mum looks gorgeous in this uh, this jacket, but I and, love the zipper. And the, and the pretty ribbon on yeah. the inside. Yeah. So you want something similar to this? Yes, I do. But I would like to look into your book of cable patterns and see if we can maybe pick a different cable that might be a bit bigger yeah. to go down there. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and finally... Can you help me with yes. so much yarn here? Um, this yarn is from the Fleece and Harmony Woolen Mill, which you will also meet in our upcoming feature. So Kim from Fleece and Harmony is going to take you through the step-by-step -step process of how she has designed her latest yarn. This isn't their latest yarn, this is their signature three-ply Aran weight in the colourway Autumn Birch. Yes, we keep thinking pumpkin. I know, I keep thinking of it as pumpkin. It's, it's so golden, it's just beautiful, but it's actually inspired by the birch trees in on Prince Edward Island in the fall season. It's going to look stunning. Yeah. I want to knit with this yarn. Do you? <laughs> you do know that you can't be a dragon when you knit this. This is yes. mine. I know, I know. <laughs> It'll be good for me. And this is the design I'm thinking of making with the yarn. It's called I Heart Aran from Tannis Fibre Arts. I particularly like the heart cables down the front and the shawl collar, which I've never knitted before. And also because it has a lot of stocking stitch at the sides, it will be easy to adjust the size if my gauge is not quite the same as the pattern. Okay, so coming up now is our special feature on Prince Edward Island. And just a quick fun fact, Prince Edward Island is named after Prince Edward, who was the Duke of Kent and Strathern in the 18th and early 19th century. And to put that into context, he was also Queen Victoria's father. And he really tried to unite the warring French and British populations by promoting a mutual Canadian identity. Now, Prince Edward Island is a bit of a mouthful to keep repeating. So the locals refer to their home as PEI. And just one more thing. If you're somebody who likes to play Where's Wally or you like to spot obscure inconsistencies in films, see if you can spot the bride with her long veil who is photobombing some of our drone footage. Edward Island is Canada's smallest province, but it has the highest concentration of lighthouses in North America. That's because it has a deeply indented coastline, and altogether there are 63 lighthouses dotted along its shores. Typically lighthouses were built out of stone, but Prince Edward Island lacks this resource, so most of the lighthouses are built from timber. They're very charming, small, square, tapered towers, and we came across many of them as we drove around the island. One evening we drove to Prince Edward Island's very first lighthouse, which was built in 1845 at Point Prim. It's one of the few round lighthouses in Canada, built out of brick, but covered in wooden shingles on the outside. It's been in service since 1845 and it was automated in 1969. We spent the evening here and watched the sun set over a metallic blue ocean. It was such a beautiful calm evening and we were the only ones there 
apart from a curious black fox that came up to us hoping to find some food. Prince Edward Island was once famous for its fox farming industry. It all began back in the 1890s with two businessmen who were experimenting with fox breeding. They succeeded in creating black foxes with silver veins in their fur and this started the so-called silver rush and Prince Edward Island became the world's leading provider of fox furs. But this all finished during the Great Depression in the 1930s because farmers couldn't afford to feed their foxes and many foxes were let loose. Nowadays the island is strongly populated by foxes and the red fox has even become declared Prince Edward Island's provincial animal. And after a generation or two, most of the foxes reverted to having red coats again. But you'll still see the occasional black fox like this one, which we came across at Point Prim. Now this is a knitting show, so we do need to get back on topic. Prince Edward Island also has a fibre trail which reaches from one end of the island to the other and takes you to around 15 or so different fibre related sites. We managed to visit a few places on this trail, starting with the McCoslands Woolen Mill, which is on the far west side of the island. And what makes this mill particularly charming is the old machinery that it still uses today. So entering the mill feels like you've been transported into a Dickens novel. The machinery was once powered by a water wheel and you can still see the old shaft and pulley system installed in the ceiling, although now the mill is powered by electricity. Hi, welcome to McCausland's Woolen Mill. I'm Monica McCausland. It's a family business and I'm the sixth generation to work here. We started in the 1870s as a sawmill and by the 1920s we were also washing wool for people to spin and process at home. By the 30s though we had fully converted over to being a woolen mill where we do the spinning of the yarn and the weaving of the blankets, which we are still doing today as seen by the yarn over my shoulder and some samples of the blankets here in my arm, in our checkerboard pattern no less. Uh, locally sourced wool here on the island there's only enough to keep us going for two up to four weeks so we do source from all over North America Canada and the States specifically Ontario and Nova Scotia have to be our biggest provincial suppliers in terms of having the Canadian cooperative wool growers uh, but we also get from individual farms all over Canada and the States anywhere from one or two fleeces off the family sheep or from hundreds if not thousands of fleeces in entire herds once it arrives here we're not very breed specific we're after the natural color so it goes into large community pools for processing. 
After the wool arrives, we begin the process with the washing, dyeing, and drying before it's brought out to the main building where the carding and spinning will happen. The carding machine is 1930s technology that used to run off the water wheel here at the mill. And so on the first breaker, it takes it from the raw fiber to a roving that you can see transfer from the first to the second breaker, where the second breaker takes it and divides it into many one plies in this pencil roving here. It's a little fragile. Some people do knit with it, but it's very not very workable within machinery. So we take it from the pencil roving over to the spinning frame, which is essentially 128 spinning wheels going at once. From there, it's in, turned from the pencil roving to a workable one ply. From there, we take it to the coner, where it'll be put onto cones for weaving with to make the warp as well as the weft of the blankets. Uh, when we're in the loom room, you can see our oldest technology and our newest technology in the mill. The warper dates to the 1910s and 20s, the warper and creel both. The looms are 2016 state-of-the-art rapier looms that I'm quite proud of. Uh, and they are used day in and day out uh, weaving blankets. Um, from there, the cuts get taken off of the looms and the blankets are inspected in the cuts of 17 blankets or so. They are washed, dried, napped, or fluffed as I call it, where we then finish them into individual blankets and uh, package them up and ship them off or have them available in the shop. Uh, just to take it back to the spinning frame, from there that workable one ply can also be turned into our yarn. On our twister, we'll tie it on by hand onto the twister table where it'll get pulled through to two or three ply. From there it fills up our wooden spools that are used on the skeiner to make the skeins that then get twisted on the hook. The hook and skeiner, much like the carding machine, used to run off the water wheel. So you can still see the shafts and pulley system that operate them. They're the only two machines that still get their primary power off of that shaft system. Also, a fun fact about the scanner is that those wooden spools often catch our customer's eye and they kind of want to ask, hey, can we have some of these antique spools? Unfortunately, no. They still work with our machinery and we use them in the day-to-day -day operations. All right, and back in the shop, you can see our two and three ply yarns on display. We have natural colors like our natural white, light and dark gray, as well as some variations that we do two white, one gray or two gray, one white uh, to kind of play with the natural colors a bit there, as well as a variety of dyed colors that you can see over my shoulder here. Um, the two ply is a, a worsted or DK weight and our three ply is an Aaron bulky weight. Um, like any small business, we're happy to be reopened after the pandemic and eager to welcome more visitors and guests and tell you all about the mill and answer any questions you might have. So please do reach out. Exactly. This is beet pulp shreds. So this is literally what's left over from processing sugar beets. Oh, okay. It's a highly digestible fiber source for mm -hmm. them. <laughs> <laughs> Pearl's the matriarch in her. So I was about to ask, is the is the like the brain thing you put like the dogs are? Do they have a similar hierarchy? Uh, they do have a hierarchy, but the hierarchy is always in a state of flux. Okay. 
<laughs> what are you doing, girl? Can I have that? Thank you. He's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's spitting. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. This is Kado. <laughs> this is Kado. Kado is about six weeks old, and Kado uh, was born a little bit early and requires some added um, supplementation with respect to nutrition. Kado is born out of the um, the breeding of my very best boy, Keswick, and one of my very best females, Sweet Streak. Now, um, Dad Keswick, even up to 14 years old, was producing a grade one fleece. Um, and we are expecting similar um, fineness in this little fellow as he ages. Now, when we shear him next year in late spring, we expect his fiber to be anywhere from five and a half to six inches long and he will maintain his color. He is a medium fawn and he'll maintain that as he ages. Kado is one of 35 alpacas I have here on the farm. Um, the majority of my alpacas are either white or light in color. I choose to uh, breed for a fine fiber which tends to result in light colored animals. I like the lighter colored animals because their fiber is easier to dye. Most of the fiber that we shear next year will go into making yarn, which will be sold in my shop. Um, usually I will send it to a local uh, mill here on the island or in Atlantic Canada, and it will be milled into either a worsted weight, a DK fingering, or even a lopy weight. We'll do a combination of 100% alpaca as well as an alpaca blend. Usually our blend is an 80-20 blend with alpaca merino, or we may use alpaca merino silk or a little, bit of, a little bit of bamboo with that. Once the yarn comes back to me, I will dye it in small batches in my shop and I sell it in the shop and online. Anne of Green Gables was written by Lucy Maud Montgomery in 1908 and readers from all over the world have fallen in love with the stories about Anne and her adventures on Prince Edward Island. We're both fans of this series, so this next section is dedicated to all fellow kindred spirits. The author Maud Montgomery was born in this little house in 1874. Two years later, her mother died of tuberculosis and she was raised by her maternal grandparents. Although Montgomery only spent the first year of her life here, she always felt an emotional attachment to this house and years later she wrote this in her journal. The years have passed on and each succeeding one has left the little brown house something shabbier than before, but its enchantment has never faded in my eyes. And this was the room where she was born. As a child, Montgomery often stayed with her Aunt Annie and Uncle John Campbell. They had a farmhouse which she called the Wonder Castle of her childhood. The farm is still owned by the Campbell family today and has been turned into the Anne of Green Gables Museum. And here's the original lap desk used by Montgomery when writing Anne of Green Gables. And here in the living room, there's the bookcase that inspired Anne of Green Gables' imaginary friend, Katie Morris. And Montgomery wrote this about it. 
Anne's Katie Morris was mine. In our sitting rooms, there had always stood a big bookcase used as a china cabinet. In each door was a large oval glass, dimly reflecting the room. And when I was very small, each of my reflections in these glass doors were real folk to my imagination. The one in the left-hand door was Katie Morris, a little girl like myself, and I loved her dearly. I would stand before that door and prattle to Katie for hours, giving and receiving confidences. We were surprised to learn that Montgomery was also a good crafter. Between the age of 12 and 16, she worked on what she called her crazy quilt. It's made up of leftover scraps of silks, velvets and satins. It took a lot of work, but by the time she finished it, crazy quilts were no longer in fashion. So it ended up in her trunk and was left there until she rediscovered it years later. So she wrote this about it in her journal. To my present taste, the quilt is inexpressibly hideous. I find it hard to believe it possible that I ever thought it beautiful, but I did think it, and I expended more grey matter devising ingenious and complicated stitches than I ever put into anything else. Many of you will recognize these books featuring traditional Scandinavian designs. I love these books and all that they represent, the history and the tradition of the garments, the people that made them, and the yarns that were used. The yarns that were used in these patterns were, were traditional homespun yarns, most often semi-worsted in traditional colors of natural black, gray, and cream. These yarns are not easy to source here in North America and certainly not easy to source by, made by local mills. So I decided to design a yarn that could be used in these motifs and patterns. The problem that I had was that you needed to find a flock of sheep that had the right type of wool. Luckily, on Prince Edward Island, we have a flock in, uh, on a farm called Wild Wind Pastures, which had the right type of sheep. The sheep are crosses between old breeds and new breeds, including North Country Cheviot, Rideau Arcot, and Coopworth. The wool is perfect for these designs and motifs. It is lofty and warm and durable, but yet can be spun to a fine weight. So I've decided to create and design a yarn that would be used in these patterns. The yarn that I made is right here. I'm really excited. It turned out exactly how I imagined it would, and we will be making it in the traditional colors, so undyed, cream, gray, and black, so you'll be able to recreate the designs just the way that they were done in the past. The yarn is, uh, is a fingering weight, and I will show you the process of how I designed it and how we made this yarn. So this is the wool as we receive it from the farm. This has been sorted to uh, take out any guard hairs or inconsistent staples. The staple of this wool from this flock is about three inches, uh, three inches long and has a medium crimp, I would say. But the special thing about the wool from this farm is that it has very little vegetation because the sheep are pastured outside all the time. Once the wool is sorted, we take it to the washer and we gently wash the wool to remove the lanolin and these uh, tips that sometimes can get on the end, ends of the wool. The wool is then taken from the washer and put on these drying racks where we allow it to dry. It takes about eight hours for the wool to dry completely. Once the wool is completely dry, we bring it over to the picking machine. So here we have the clean wool it runs through some drums and it separates 
all of the uh, staples so that the, the yarn is already starting to become very lofty. At this time, we also add conditioner to the wool, which will help aid in the spinning later. This machine is the fiber separator. The fiber separator is usually used to remove guard hairs and vegetation, and we usually put our wool through this machine twice. With this particular wool from Wild Wind Pastures, we only need to put it through the fiber separator once because it is so clean and free of vegetation. When the wool comes out of the fiber separator, it's ready to go to the carter. At the carter, the wool is really clean by the, at this point, and it goes through 13 drums in the carding machine to create a roving or a sliver. The roving and the sliver or sliver has already have fibers that are starting to become aligned to create the semi-worsted yarn that we're going to make. Once these cans are filled with the amount that we need for the roving, we take it over to the draw frame and at the draw frame we start the drafting process. The draw frame starts the drafting process and we put the rovings through this machine twice, always combining two rovings at a time to get the most consistent final roving that we can get to go over to the spinner. Here we are at the spinner and this is where the magic happens. This is where the actual yarn design happens. We need to know the specs of the yarn that we want as a final yarn before I start the spinning. So I've decided that I want to make a yarn that has good durability but still retain some of the loftiness. So the tighter the twist that I put in the yarn, the more rustic the yarn will be and the less lofty. So I have to find a balance for the twist per inch that will give me the final yarn that I want, loftiness and durability. We also set the draft here at the spinner and this is one of the finer yarns that we make in the mill. So the drafting is going to be at quite a high level to get a very fine ply. And all of that is done at this machine, the spinner. So here we are at the plier. This is the final stage before we have a finished yarn. I'm making a two ply yarn, so I'm taking two bobbins and I'm plying the two strands from those bobbins together to make the two ply yarn. What's really important here at the plying stage is that we finish with a balanced yarn. A balanced yarn means that the yarn has no twist in itself if it's looped together. If the yarn is unbalanced, the knitter will find that the garment that they knit with an unbalanced yarn will t twist on the bias in the garment itself, or when they're pulling it from the ball, it will twist on itself. So I'm happy to say that we did the test and I have my loop of yarn here and I can hold it up and you can see that it is a balanced yarn. So the final, final steps are to cone the yarn, create the hanks and then wash the hanks. Then we'll put it up in the shop and there you can find it for your knitting pleasure. So welcome back. I hope you really enjoyed our PEI special. I'm a local now. <laughs> <laughs> Especially seeing that gorgeous baby alpaca being bottle fed. Yeah. Don't know if you picked up, but his name was Cadeau. Is that how you say it in French or? I think in France you'd say cadeau, which means present. Yeah. So he's called a present because his mother became 
unexpectedly pregnant with him. It wasn't quite an immaculate conception, but rather his father was accidentally let in with his mother when she was thought to be past her breeding season. It's always good when that happens and you get a little present. <laughs> okay, now before Madeline shows you her presentation, I'm really happy to say that Fleece and Harmony is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 15% discount of all Fleece and Harmony yarns as well as Rowan yarns from their online store. All their own yarns are made with wool and other natural fibres sourced on PEI and they're either hand dyed or left in their natural shades. And their most popular yarns are the Signature Aran, which is what Madeline's got, the Selkirk Worsted and Point Prim Sock Yarn. And I should mention here that Fleece and Harmony are also a Rowan flagship. And for every Rowan yarn range that they stock, and they do stock most of them, they will have the amount in jumper quantities and in every colour available. Well, we were surprised to learn that many people aren't aware of the additional resources we offer our viewers and patrons. So I thought I'd take this opportunity to quickly show you our blog and how to use it because I think this will save you a lot of time and help you get the most value out of our show and what we produce. So that is coming up now. Here we are on the homepage of fruityknitting.com and I'm viewing the website on a computer, so it'll look slightly different on a phone. This here is the top menu bar and when you click on episodes, you will find all of our episode posts in chronological order. So here's episode 125, episode 124, 123, and so on and so forth. If we click on episode 125, we have the full summary of everything that's included in that episode. Now, a lot of our viewers want to find the episode in which we talk about a specific topic or uh, had a specific guest on our show. And an easy way to do this is to type a relevant keyword into the search bar that's right here. For example, if you're interested in grafting your project and would like to find an episode in which we discuss the subject, type the keyword grafting here in the search bar and then click enter. You want to keep your keywords short. Now the results will show every episode that includes grafting. All right, so let's go to episode 57, which featured Meg Swanson. She's the daughter of Elizabeth Zimmerman. As we scroll down, we can see that in this episode, Mum talked about how to fix your mistakes by cutting and grafting in garter stitch. So back then, Mum had made her ribbing too long, and she wanted to fix that without having to rip back all of her beautiful cabling. If you want to watch this episode, then you can scroll up again and just click the highlighted episode 57. That will take you straight to the episode on YouTube. We have produced 126 episodes by now and we featured well over 200 guests on Fruity Knitting. You can find our guests and the episode they feature in by clicking on guests on the top menu bar. And here you will see all the indexes of the main segments that we have in our episodes. So at the top, we've got our interview guests for the feature interviews. Then we've got new releases, meet the shepherdess, and finally knitters of the world. So if you want to know whether someone has been featured on our show or you can't remember which episode the guest was on, then these indexes will save you a lot of time. Our episode always contains a feature interview, which is at least 30 minutes long. And when I click on interview guests, you will see this very long list here. It's by far the longest list out of all of our indexes. Mum's just shown you her beautiful Boho Stickning jumper. So let's go to the Boho Stickning interview, which was back in episode 112. Now when I click the link, the link will take me directly to the interview on YouTube. Let's go back to guests on the top menu bar. So I'm going to click on that now. Now maybe you feel like watching a Meet the Shepherdess segment and we don't feature them in every episode so the fastest way to find one is through the Meet the Shepherdess index. I'm going to click on that now. 
let's say good day to Murray and Harry Watson from Millpost Merino. They are two brothers and the seventh generation to run their family sheep farm in New South Wales. G'day, my name's Murray Watson. And I'm Harry, Murray's brother, and we're from Millpost, a sheep farm on the New South Wales Southern Tablelands near Bungendore, which is about half an hour east of Canberra, Australia's capital. So uh, Millpost, a family farm, our parents, Judith and David. I think you understand the guest indexes now, so let's move on to the tutorials. Early on, we created some video tutorials that take you through a whole project from start to finish. So mum takes you through the different steps and necessary techniques along the way. There are five of these all together, and you can find them by clicking on tutorials, which is on the top menu bar next to guests. So here's the windy scarf right at the top by Martin Story. We've got the barble hat, the calder beanie, the mist slouchy, and then on the next page, we have the Darkness Coat by Kim Hargraves, which has been our most popular tutorial out of the five. Now these tutorials are visible to everyone, but we also have a special tutorial index, which is only available to our patrons. And on the left side of our blog, we provide several links for our patrons. I will show you the others, but first let's get onto the tutorial index. So I'm gonna click on that. And as you can see, we have lots of tutorials. Some are simple and some are more complex for advanced knitters. I'm going to click on the tutorial called Reinforcing the Sticks with a Sewing Machine. Because I'm a patron, I'll have immediate access, but if you're not a patron, you will have to sign up first. All right, let's go back to the links for patrons. Now up the top, we always have the current patron discount, as well as the upcoming Fruity Knitting Live event, which our Shetland patrons can attend live and both Shetland and Marina patrons can listen to as an audio podcast later on. Then we have our Fruity Knitting Patron Community Forum, and that's where patrons can come together to discuss and show off their projects or ask each other questions if they need help. And finally, here is the link to our audio podcast index for our Shetland and Marino patrons. So there are 61 audio podcasts available altogether. And when I click the link here, it takes me directly to Patreon. We recently had a very fun event with Sarah Hatton, which was filled with funny stories and very valuable knitting advice. You don't need to be on the Patreon website to listen to these audio podcasts. You can also access them with your preferred podcast app on your phone. We're back on the Fruit and Knitting blog now. If you would like to become a patron and support our work, then you can find all the relevant details here by clicking on Contribute. And if you're having any difficulties, you can go up to the top menu bar and click on Patron Sign Up Help. Here we have some simple instructions on how to become a Fruit and Knitting patron or how to change your level of support. I hope Madeline's presentation will help you make better use of the rich body of content that we've created over the years. Now all that content is our product and we make our product available for free so that we can get the views because being able to offer interview guests an extremely high exposure means we can attract good guests who are willing to work with me to produce a really good quality interview. It really is all the preparation that goes on behind the scenes that makes the difference for an interview to be content rich and interesting for you to watch and learn from. If we only made that content available to our patrons, the episodes would hardly get seen and that's really mm. unattractive to guests. Yeah. However, for us to keep producing Fruity Knitting, we need enough of our viewers to decide to become patrons, even though they don't have to, to watch the show. So if you are watching, for whatever reason, maybe you want to check out some techniques or you want to see some of the interviews or some of those topics that we show, please do support our work by becoming a patron. You can do so for just the cost of one coffee per month. And if for any knitter who's buying yarn regularly, that's extremely affordable. So it's just in this content 
context that I want to point out and really deeply thank the wonderful patrons who have made it possible for us to create such an extensive body of work for the rest of the knitting world to be able to use and learn from. So thank you very much and please do become a patron, not just for the patron discounts, but because you really value the show and what it, it can teach people. Okay, so coming up now is our special feature with the Saltwater Knitting Ladies, Christine Legros and Shirley Scott. Christine and Shirley have made it their mission to preserve Newfoundland knitting traditions and techniques. And they've done that through their four books, which are not just about knitting. They also tell a lot about the life and culture of Newfoundland. And we are coming into winter now, so I thought we should do another knit along, because I think many of you are gonna be tempted to knit up a pair of Newfoundland trigger mitts once you see them. They're quite bizarre looking, but really practical. Yeah. So I thought we would call the knit along the Saltwater Knitting Carl. And I think we should call it the Trigger Mitt Along. The Trigger Mitt Along, yes. Yeah. Look, no, Saltwater, because basically you can knit any of the designs from the Saltwater books, and it's not yeah. just mittens, there's socks and hats and all kinds of things. So we'll call it the Saltwater Knitting Carl, and it'll be held over in the Fruity Knitting Ravelry Group and the Fruity Knitting Patron Communities Forum. And I'm really happy to say that the publishing house Boulder Books is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 10% discount of all four saltwater books. And this includes saltwater mittens, saltwater classics, saltwater gifts and saltwater socks. So thank you very much to Christine and Shirley and Boulder Books Publishing. So we've brought Jack up so you can quickly have a look at him. <laughs> He's just been sleeping. Some people have been asking us how he is when we go away traveling and as you can see he's healthy and happy we leave him with another group of dogs and he always comes back looking fitter and happier than when we left him so we're always happy about that yeah it's time for us to say goodbye now thanks for spending time with us bye, bye. Jack, we got to load him up to a fight to have a long But my next partner will be a wrestler twice as big and strong And never again will I go out across the box so far I'll wait till I see one on the road and a winging wit maker Ha! That's how we'll get me moose, boy! I to go hunting, hunting in the fall Welcome to Fruity Knitting. Today I'm joined by the best-selling co-authors of the Saltwater Knitting series, Christine Legros and Shirley Scott. So both Christine and Shirley are lifelong knitters and over the last 16 years or so, they have been unearthing, preserving and recreating traditional knitting patterns and techniques that Newfoundland knitters have long practiced. And there's now four books in the award-winning series. And the books are not just about knitting. They also tell a lot about the life and culture of Newfoundland. So Christine and Shelley, I am so thrilled to have you both on Fruity Knitting. Thank you for sharing your work with us. Thank you for inviting us. It's a true honor to be here with you today. Good. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. Good. Okay, so first of all, I would like our worldwide viewers to have a better understanding of Newfoundland. So could you tell us something about its history and culture and why you both love it and have made it the centre of your work? And I thought we'd start with you, Christine, because you are a born and bred Newfoundlander. So That's tell so us true. something about That's the history true. and culture. Well, I, I am a Newfoundlander and I am rooted to that rocky island way out there in the North Atlantic, just like a Tuckamore. And you may need to look that up in the dictionary, but it really means you are really there for the long haul. <laughs> Another thing about Newfoundland you have got to know, and it's the reason knitting is probably so predominant in our culture, is the weather. It's mm. windy, foggy, hot, cold, snowy, rainy, and that's all in one 24-hour period sometimes. All four seasons in one day. The other thing that's really important about our history in Newfoundland is that it was based on uh, our, our business and the backbone of our economy was based on the cod fishery. And that goes back 
centuries, but a little bit more about the beginning. Indigenous people populated the island of Newfoundland for thousands of years, but about a thousand years ago, uh, Leif Erikson and the Vikings came over to Newfoundland and they set up a, a, a sod huts and a village there near Lansa Meadows, Newfoundland, and they stayed a while. And you know, the, the Vikings were rough and ready, hardy people, but guess what? Maybe it was the weather. They left. <laughs> Next came European explorers. And just one of those explorers was named Lord Baltimore. His uh, actual name is John Calvert. He tried staying. He brought women and there were children. And they decided after a very short time and battling with the French, they were fighting for the English, they couldn't handle not the invading French, but they couldn't handle the weather. So they all jumped aboard their ships and they sailed south and they landed in what is now uh, Maryland in the U United States. Okay. And uh, hence they have a city called Baltimore after Lord Baltimore. But that's enough about the explorers. Eventually the fishermen stayed and fished the cod for much of Europe and they eventually had women and children and they were smart enough when they came over from the ships in Europe to bring sheep. Yeah. And they brought the sheep because they knew they would need the fleece from those sheep and the meat from the sheep mm. so that they would survive. And my connection to knitting and connected to the history of all that is my earliest childhood memories are of my mom and my grandmother knitting. All the people around me knit. When I went to school, we knit at school. We knit at brownies. We knit at girl guides. Our whole life was centered around knitting. And that's why knitting is so important to me. I thought it was really important to keep going in the modern world. Yeah. Okay. And Shirley, you've been researching traditional knitting in Canada for over 40 years, haven't you? So that's right. Um, I fell in love with Newfoundland. You'd have to describe it that way probably about 30 years ago and began coming here on vacations. I only moved here permanently in 2006, so I'm what is known as a mainlander, and probably I'll always be called a mainlander. But I fell in love with the place, very welcoming, especially if you're a knitter. There was so much to look at, and I saw these wonderful mittens, and I began buying them 30 years ago. I had been influenced by the American woman, Robin Hanson, who did a great deal of work in Newfoundland. I think it was in the 1970s, actually. And she sensitized a lot of people to the fact that this was something special. And because of that, I began collecting it. I think Christine had kept things all her life from, from Newfoundland here. But I've always loved knitting that had a history and knitting that showed a particular place. So I was just in my element when I moved here. And then, of course, I met Christine, who thought the same way I thought and cared about the same things I thought uh, I cared about. And between the two of us, we got to work on this project. We had a historical mission from the very beginning, and it was simply to save these designs and get them written down. They had never been written down. Yeah. And uh, that was how we began. We weren't thinking beauty or anything. We were thinking of just getting them down. That's right. And you um, got together, this was before computers, in a cafe. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell us quickly about that. Yes. Uh, it took us three years, having a lot of fun and only meeting occasionally for coffee to chart 30 pairs of mittens, after which we wrote four books in five years. <laughs> and the so, original was just pen and paper. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, it, it's still quite a lot of pen and paper when, when we were doing our work. But in any case, uh, we had an awful lot of fun in a coffee shop. We tried things on the gentleman in the coffee shop to see if the sizing was right. That didn't work out so well well sometimes <laughs> but yes we were it was born in a coffee shop believe me <laughs> so what makes Newfoundland knitting so distinctive particularly with the accessories which we have a lot on the table like the mittens if you see a Newfoundland mitten anywhere in the world you know it's from Newfoundland and how is that well this is a typical Newfoundland trigger mitt and you can tell immediately 
that it's related to the fine knitting of Britain, uh, fine knit gloves in particular. A nice little geometric pattern in the front and a good bit of ferrule in the rest of the mitten so that it would be twice as warm. Uh, these would have been gloves in England for sure. People did not wear this type of mitten. When we got to Newfoundland, mittens are much warmer, much better to wear a mitten than a glove. <laughs> so it developed in that direction. Only one finger left. We use this for our work very often. Uh, the wool is much heavier because we had very rough sheep that had terrible lives and uh, the wool was not soft and beautiful. You did whatever you could with it. You spun your own. You probably carved your own knitting needles and had to make wool that would work with your own knit needles. Gosh. So that's how <laughs> things were adapted when we got to Newfoundland. But we never lost the essence to my mind, of it being a mitten you could recognize from Britain. Yeah. And mm -hmm. also you were telling me before that um, knitters had high prestige. So say something about that. You could not survive here without good covering for your hands and for your feet in winter. And uh, the fishery, whether you're driving a nail, just about any work, nobody sat at a desk to make money in Newfoundland. Everybody was out working outdoors all the time. And so you needed things like this. And of course, almost everybody could make them, but everybody knew who made the best ones and the tightest ones, the ones that would last the longest. And those knitters would have a lot of prestige in the community. They did not just turn them out. They took the time to make a quality product, which I find very interesting. And say something very quickly before Christine shows us some more mittens about the government, the provincial government, because they really supported the craft later on, haven't yes. they? That's right. Our, we live in a very fortunate place for all types of craft education, but the government is very involved, not only in making sure people know how to do these things uh, and uh, know the value of them, and this goes for every from boat building to trigger mitt knitting, but um, great lot of education and um, helping people sell their work. There's a lot of encouragement for things like that. There are not many places where your government knows that this is a valuable thing to do, but Newfoundland is a place where they do. Well, that's great. <laughs> that's definitely true. Okay, Christine, show us more about the, the typical patterns. And yes, the typical patterns of Newfoundland mittens. Uh, we're talking going back a couple hundred years now, and we must realize that there was not a lot of formal education. People knew a basic X, and they, they knew how to follow what the person sitting next to them was making, be it their mother or their grandmother. And we need to remember also that way back then there was no electric light. You knit when it was daylight or you knit by the fire or you knit by a candle. So we have to appreciate the difficulty it was to try to knit your mitten better than your mom's mitten yeah. so she'd be proud of you, yeah. you know? So uh, hence it developed instead of, as Shirley said, with fancy patterns going up the front and continuing on the back, to keep it nice and simple mm. and easy to teach, it was more of a block of a geometric design, and it was one, two, three stitches, something that you could turn into a really pretty shape and would hold interest for the knitter, and it ended right here because you wanted to keep the double ferrule quality, mm -hmm. the same way that uh, thermal underwear now keeps you warmer, non-thermal underwear, trigger mitts knit this way keeps you warmer than regular mittens. Yeah. So in the olden days, because of the fact that they couldn't read or write very well, or probably not at all, they would switch to knit one light, knit one dark, knit one night light, and they normally only use the colors that they had of sheep, mostly a natural washed kind of white color, more of a cream, and then whatever shade of brown or dark brown or beigey brown that those sheep happened to be, they'd mix a bit of the two. So you had a light and dark contrast. And then the back was just kept like that. And they also developed a shaped thumb gusset, just like this part of your hand is shaped. It's not yeah. a straight line. Yeah, yeah. So they did it so you could do the pinch, whether you were jigging a codnet, 
in July month because the Atlantic Ocean is cold and fishermen didn't mind their hands getting wet because wool kept their hands yes. warm even when it was wet. So by having these uh, trigger fingers, you could jig your codfish or you could grab onto your partner as you're hauling in a net. You could do all kinds of yeah. things that mittens won't accommodate. So I'll just cover the few mm -hmm. that are really important. It was the diamond one. This is the most popular one for the past, say, 100 years. Okay. And then we have, uh, this was a Labrador diamond in some circles. There's names galore for all of these. This is called, in my era, the St. Mary's Bay Diamond. That's okay. another part of Newfoundland. That's a gorgeous one. Yeah. That's really nice, really nice. And then they switched out to sort of a check, but it's modified. You can see in this one that there's a salt and pepper break between, yeah, and yeah. it's not quite checks, you know, because uh, knitting stitches aren't really square. And they've got the salt and pepper on the back. The wrists are nice and snug. And they're very thick. And do very they, thick. Do they always have the stripes on the cuffs? Yes, That's yes. So, yeah. yeah. Um, in modern times, there are not stripes, but this yeah. is the traditional, yeah. you know, and yeah. it was like a knit to a uh, pearl one ribbed cuff. Nice and long. You can't have a skimpy cuff for the snow's blowing up your sleeves. <laughs> so these, and this one here is uh, reminiscent of the waves on the ocean. Okay. This one is waves on the ocean. It's called blowing a gale. Uh, in our saltwater mittens book and so normally they were all just the shades of sheep even though here we've used gray and white because we're living in 2022 and Shirley and I don't raise our own sheep and but once I think they look beautiful <laughs> I really they are like they're, the they're, they're really yeah. really nice and little children once in a while did get a pair of uh, salt and pepper mittens no fancy patterns because you wouldn't be able to fit all that in a little tiny mitt so they kind of look like this and Kids are likely to lose their mittens, so why would you really put that fast. extra yeah. work into But them? you wanted the warmth in there. Yeah. You still wanted the warmth. The other couple of things in Newfoundland traditional knitting that are really important are regular work socks. Mm -hmm. No fancy stuff here. You mm -hmm. just wanted them to wear in your boots and out, out in the garden and around the house. And this is called a vamp. It's just uh, forget the leg. You needed to knit them fast. Sometimes you even wore them over your long socks. Or you wore them over anything else you could find to put on your feet instead of shoes. Yes. Because not everybody had shoes way back then. Yeah. So those were really important. And that's part of our historical heritage of knitting are the trigger okay. mitts and the socks and vamps. So when, how closely did you stick to the vintage patterns when you were turning them into written designs? We stayed very close to our vintage mittens when we wrote the patterns for the first book. Interestingly enough, there was not a great deal of variation between the many mittens that we had bought. And so it was quite easy to uh, get a set of directions. It was easy to chart them, but we did have to play around. We were very careful to never label anything that we saw as a mistake. If they had done it for 200 years, perhaps there was a reason for it. Yeah. So we were very tolerant of things like that. We did, however, see signs of struggle <laughs> in some mittens. That's the only way I can phrase it. For example, and we don't have any to show you of the old ones, but uh, if a knitter didn't realize that you need an odd number of stitches to work in salt and pepper around a mitten, they went through some very interesting uh, diversions and improvisations <laughs> to see what to do with that extra stitch. So that was quite cute, noticing all those things. Of course, we do not think we are smarter than they were. Believe me, we do not. The other thing I noticed was that there was really no concept of gauge. If a knitter knew that a man's mitten should have 54 stitches in it, that knitter knit 54 stitches no matter what she had to knit it with. And there are orangutan-sized mittens, <laughs> and there are some very shrunken mittens because it is hard to fool around with the geometry of these patterns, but they just 
knit the 54 stitches and found somebody that could wear it. <laughs> so those were the uh, things that we had noticed. But when it came right down to it, Christine and I both agreed that our real contribution wasn't straightening out their mistakes. Our real contribution was, first of all, just to get them down in writing. Yes. A set of modern instructions that people could follow anywhere and that we hope will live on for quite a good while. And then we also, uh, another contribution was adding color to the mittens. They only had natural color yarns. They'd have two or three maybe in a mitten, probably only two. I know that if you had a black sheep, People wanted your wool so that they could have another color to work with. But these days, Christine and I have brought a lot of color to the mittens, and people really enjoy that. And then we've developed a few little finishing touches. For example, uh, we use a three-needle bind-off to make a nice round top on our mittens, and it matches the two colors very nicely, but this was not done in the old days. Uh, they would have grafted it with a single color. Nothing wrong with that, but we thought we would bring this little touch to our mittens, and that's pretty much all that we've done other than recording them, is adding a few little touches. Yeah, okay. So can you just talk a little bit about the typical yarn that was historically used in Newfoundland? Newfoundland sheep wool uh, is really rough and ready and it's really hardy. And part of the reason for that is those sheep have been coming here since the 1600s, 1700s on ships from various parts of Europe multiple different breeds and then they got placed on an island with very little feed or grain or hay. They, those sheep evolved to survive eating things like beach peas <laughs> covered in salt water and bits of Labrador tea bushes and blueberry bushes and whatever those sheep could eat to survive yeah. that's how they evolved and they evolved with really rough fleece yes. it's extremely rough and ready and the sheep are a medium size breed of sheep and locally they are called newfoundland local sheep they're a rare breed and they've uh, evolved into three different subspecies almost okay. in three different areas of newfoundland because way back over the hundreds of years Newfoundland was sparsely populated along the coast and there was no way for a sheep on the west coast, 900 kilometers from the sheep in St. Jack's on the south coast, to ever breed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so they have since then bred that there's three distinct groups of Newfoundland local heritage sheep. Uh, some are on the south coast down in St. Jack's where they've mm -hmm. only put in roads the past 50 years. You had to get there by a coastal boat before then and then over on the west coast and then in the northern part of trinity bay on the northeast coast and the east coast near the avalon peninsula and that's where most of the sheep were in that era because that's where most of the knitters happened to live because of the cod fishery okay in towns yeah. like bonavista and down on the south in grand bank so that that wool was really rough and ready but now Newfoundland only joined Canada uh, 65, 67 years ago. I mean, it's really recent. And if you happen to live in the city of St. John's or the town of Grand Bank or the town of Bonavista, you got all your goods by steamer from Britain and uh, other parts of Europe, but mainly England, a little bit from Ireland. So uh, Newfoundlanders that were able to afford it love to knit with beehive yarns and beehive pattern books. So that influenced the knitting in Newfoundland for at least the past hundred years, if not a little bit longer. Okay, because so much more towards Britain than America. Way more European influence with the fine yarns like uh, beehive double knitting, beehive fine sock yarn, beehive fingering, beehive four ply. <laughs> That was a really big influence, and it was a, a really big factor in when people wanted to do special knitting for baby gifts. Okay, and yeah. we evolved into using fine yarns, but we still kept the Newfoundland sheep. 
Well, you still needed them, didn't you? Mm -hmm. The weather didn't change. The weather didn't change. <laughs> okay. And then there's Briggs and Little, isn't there? Yes. It's the yarn that we use for just about everything in our books. There are not very many woolen mills left in Canada, and especially woolen mills that use Canadian wool. But Briggs and Little is one, and it has been there for at least 150 years. I know my great-grandmother knit with the yarn from that mill, and she would have got it from an itinerant peddler, somebody that just went door-to-door -door selling it. So it's been around a long time for a very good reason. It is a good, strong, lasting yarn. You can wear it for work, which we're always thinking, we're not going fine and soft no. in our mittens. <laughs> no. It just, they're not going to last for more than a couple of weeks. And we have mittens that last for years and years. And that's what it looks like. It's available in many weights. And it's a uh, two-ply. And it's quite a rustic yarn. It's it? rustic is what you yeah. would say for sure. But uh, we call it sturdy. Sturdy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you may not be wearing it next to your skin in underwear, for example. <laughs> but it's excellent for outerwear, which is yes. what we specialize mm -hmm. Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it also has some other really good qualities. It's widely available in Canada and it's a big country and there's a lot of diversity in what you can buy in yarn now but you can always get Briggs and Little so that's one of the best things it's very affordable nobody has to worry about it uh, breaking the bank to buy a few skeins of this to do their that's work great. and that's yeah. quite important it actually is. it is people are on a budget you know uh, and it has wonderful colors so both Christine and I have knit with it for at least 50 years. We have not come near exhausting the color possibilities. I still find it fascinating to think up new ways of using the shades. And even better, it's not like lipstick. The same shade will be there the next year. If you need a skein, another skein of this same shade in two years time it will still be there whereas your lipstick will not be <laughs> yeah and i can feel that it's actually a good uh yarn for stranded knitting because it's quite sticky too yes mm -hmm. isn't it mm -hmm. it's Just, wool and spun yes mm -hmm. hearing you talk about it it reminds me of the shetlanders and their jamesons of um shetland uh -huh. yarn because they have yeah. hundreds of colors yeah. And it's very reasonably priced, mm -hmm. and it's typically what the islanders would knit with. When you're and doing the ends in with this wool, two stitches is all you have to put it under. Yeah. It will never come out. That's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, now so far, four books have been published in this series, and each book has a theme. So what we're going to do now is have a look at the books and go through the themes. Well, our first book, of course, was called Saltwater Mittens. A brilliant title, wasn't it, Christine? It was great. You <laughs> thought of it. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> In any case, it was 2,000 copies were made of this book, and we did not anticipate there would ever be anything more than a local audience. And uh, in fact, there was a time Christine said, surely we had better clear our visas because we're going to have to buy all of those books ourselves, you know. And we really thought that was possible. However, it sold out very, very quickly. And then suddenly there were reprints. And suddenly people in Australia were buying it. We still do not know why. And people all over the world wanted this book. So this came as a great surprise to us. All in all, it's well over 20,000 copies that have been printed. And that may not sound like a lot from a big country like the United States, but in a place like Canada and a small publisher from Newfoundland, a publishing company that has three people in it, <laughs> yeah. that was uh, an absolutely a major thing. We won quite a few awards with it, which also came as a surprise to us. So. Congratulations. That's just fantastic. Okay, so the second book was Saltwater Classics. Yes, for sure. And we decided to put the moose on the front of that because 
this book, all of our books have themes, and the theme from this one it was celebrating again Newfoundland's knitting history. But we wanted to concentrate on the places that are colorful in Newfoundland, and the music that makes us very distinctive. Our music and our accents. So <laughs> this moose cap, moose were imported into Newfoundland. They aren't they aren't a native animal, but everybody goes moose hunting, and there's a band called Buddy Wass's Name and the other fellers, and they wrote a really popular song, a hit called Gotta Get Me Moose By. And so a, everybody wears a moose hat. So we put that one on the cover with uh, Shirley's Hello Good. Hello, May I just it. say one little thing? It was very hard to keep Christine from putting recipes in the book. <laughs> That's all I wanted to say on that. <laughs> Maybe in the fifth book. Maybe in the fifth book. And then another one, uh, this is just a very subtle arch design in this. It's a beanie and it's got kind of, you know, a mm -hmm. sea urchin pattern decrease at the top. There's a Tickle Cove pond and there's a famous song in Newfoundland about a mirror that almost drowns in that one, and it's about Tickle Cove Pond. But the reason I put arches in this one is because there's a very scenic sea arch in Tickle Cove. It's a really geometric wonder, that is. And then Noggin Cove. There is a town called, a place called Noggin Cove. This looks like a thrummed cap, but it yes. isn't. It's a fake. It's not a thrummed cap at all. You carry the wool on some rounds and you don't carry it on the other. And noggins in Newfoundland were used to store rum and some people used to use them to store butter. And Noggin Cove has rocks in the bay that look like Newfoundland noggins for storing rum. And this is the Viking helmet. And we know all about the Vikings, yes. so we had to have a Viking a helmet representative. And then one of Newfoundland's most famous son, his name is Harry Hibbs, and he was a Newfoundland singer. And he used to wear a tweed woven Irish newsboy cap. And Newfoundlanders decided, you can't be at that, Harry. We got a Nietzsche cap. So this became <laughs> Harry Hibbs' cap. And that's also on the cover of Classics. And very quickly, Emile Benoit, he was from our French culture in Newfoundland on the West Coast, the Port of Port Peninsula area in Stephenville. And um, he was a beautiful violinist. His first violin his father made by carving it out of a Newfoundland tree, <laughs> just very roughly. But he made a living out of that after he went all over the world. So his name was Emile Benoit, and uh, I call this Mitten and Trigger Mitten. Vive La Rose. Very yeah. quickly, I just want to say, when I first heard trigger mittens, I thought yes. it was so that people could, you know, go out and hunt. Yeah, It's yeah. got nothing to do with guns, No, it? no, it's just kind of the, when you put it on, you're like, you know, you want to, <laughs> like that, but you wouldn't be able to fit your, your finger, finger through the trigger yeah. to pull it, yeah. so it wouldn't work. And then we're all about... Uh, Historic towns and salt box houses. You might have to look up that. You might have to Google that, find out what a salt box, ha box house is. But these are little mock beggar trigger mitts for uh, mittens done fair isle out of seven different colors to celebrate our very colorful houses. And there really is a place called Mock Beggar. And this one I love. These are Shirley's. Diamond Vamps from Little Heart's Ease, and it's where you go to feel really mellow, and it's a beautiful little town, and it's this long and winding road to get to it, and I love Little Heart's Ease Diamond Vamps. Thank you for doing those, Shirley. You're welcome. <laughs> I had the originals for 20 years and thought it would be impossible to write a pattern, and one day I wrote it, and it worked out. <laughs> So a lot of the patterns are quite sentimental, and so you could imagine mm -hmm. that Newfoundland is all around the world. Yes. Mm -hmm. If they get the book, it's like, oh, I know that place, or I yes. know, I've heard they of that do. musician, yes. or I know yeah. that song. Mm -hmm. So yes. it's a real connection yes. to home. And they write us and yeah. tell us all the reasons yeah. why now they've started knitting, and they're linked to home, and how it makes them feel warm and cozy, yes. and sometimes makes them cry. But yes. uh, it's, that, that's been a yeah. really worthwhile yes. result for Shirley yes. and I. Mm. Yeah. to get those yes. feelings, you know, yeah. sent and, to and us. And to put our textile heritage on the world stage. That's true. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. true. Yeah. It's quite a, it's a really amazing thing to have done. Of course, it was totally accidental, but we did it. Yes. <laughs> now, the third book. Yes. Which is Saltwater Gifts. Yes. This was book three, 
done in three years, we were really on a roll. And what Saltwater Gifts does is takes you through the Newfoundland calendar. Uh, we have more public holidays than any other place in Canada. We celebrate them all, often with a day off work. It shocks people. And um, you need to know what to wear on some of these holidays. Some are weather <laughs> holidays and some are real holidays. But, uh, and also the spirit of gift giving, which is very big with Newfoundlanders. So uh, that's what that book's about. We say about celebration and um, commemoration. So we have weather events, as I mentioned, and this is the Sheila's Brush Cap. So every year around St. Patrick's Day, there is a fierce storm. And Sheila is either said to be St. Patrick's sister or perhaps his wife. And uh, she, the storm is named after her. It will be exactly around St. Patrick's Day. And in Newfoundland, Sheila's Brush, we wait for it every year. Winter is not over until Sheila's Brush storm. Uh, apparently, it's only in Australia and Newfoundland, places with a certain Irish derivation, that it is still observed, Sheila. So that looks very fine on you, Andrea. <laughs> the colour yeah. looks the great. The colour looks gorgeous, yeah. 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 Uh-huh. So continuing, although I'm not starting at the beginning of the year, the winter solstice is quite an event in Newfoundland. There are lots of bonfires. We go, we go in the very early morning to see the sunrise. And um, these are the colors that you will see. Uh, you'll notice not a trigger mitt. It's got a picket fence top. Lots of people prefer that. They have a nice fit. In any case, um, we always make this very silly mistake. We look out over the ocean expecting the sun to rise in winter, but that's where it rises in summer. <laughs> so it always rises behind our backs. <laughs> Usually but, there's a hill. <laughs> yes, but we are always still looking out to sea. So the month of May was a very important month for men in the Newfoundland calendar. The 24th of May weekend, uh, otherwise known as Victoria Day, is the Trouters weekend, and that is trout fishing. And the men, there was a special train that I would love to have been on called the Trouters Express. Men would take it for the weekend and jump off anywhere in the middle of the woods where they had a cabin. And they'd have quite a time, I think. And then by the end of the weekend, they'd all come back in fairly sorry shape <laughs> on the train. But anyhow, um, the Trouders met that weekend. They always said St. John's Newfoundland was empty of men. <laughs> they'd all gone on the train. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then, as I mentioned, we also like to commemorate things. And um, on uh, the 1st of July in 1916, the first day of the Battle of the Somme, the Royal Newfoundland Regiment suffered severe losses, severe losses. And the sock, a soldier's sock, was actually um, developed from um, an old sock that was kept in a museum collection from that time period. Uh, nice and stretchy, the, the colors at the top would signify the size so that when they were handed out, soldiers had half a chance of getting one that would fit. And there was a lively trade in them in Britain. This is the dress sock weight, but it's also done as a work sock in saltwater gifts. So that's our commemoration. Wow. We never forget them. There's so many stories. <laughs> there's so, so many, many stories. And now there's a fourth book, which has just been published, and it's coming out during the festival, but we don't yes. have a copy, a copy with us. But We have not seen it. <laughs> we haven't seen it either. Okay, so quickly tell us a little bit about the fourth book. Okay. Um, we started using some fine sock yarns mm -hmm. that people have in their stash little oddments that everybody wants to use up because in 2022 there is such a variety of wool so we still use Briggs and Little in a lot of the patterns but um, we use Croy and specialty hand dyed yarns and for the little kitties we got puffin socks because it's the provincial bird of Newfoundland but it's very Popular bird in Iceland, too. I so know I mean, a lot of adults would want to people. wear puffin socks. Yes, that's for sure. <laughs> and at um, Wales, 
uh, whales migrate past Newfoundland. So for the bigger children, we've got whale tail socks. Oh, and great. Shirley's going to give you a little sneak peek of a couple of hers. Okay. Right. So I made another Newfoundland vamp, which remember, they are the slipper socks of Newfoundland. And uh, in these nice bright colors that we call Signal Hill pattern. And um, I thought, why do we leave a boring soul to these, especially when somebody sitting across the room is going to be looking at your foot quite a lot in the middle of winter. So I put a sweetheart soul on it, and it makes it more fun to knit, definitely does. And it, it sends a little message of cheer across You're the You're going room. to encourage people to stick their feet up on the table. That's right, which they seem to do anyhow. <laughs> and uh, we wanted to do not just socks, because it, it's people, uh, we have a lot of uh, new be knitters that use our books and not everyone has actually knit a sock so we've done some other accessories as well and these are two little wristers I had to go back to the old poem we learned in school uh, I must go down to the sea again to the lonely sea in the sky for uh. these and this is called the whale's way and this is called the gull's way and of course, you can make them to mix and match or whatever. And as I always re remind people, remember, humans came from the ocean, <laughs> first of all. So those are just a couple of the little designs that we've done in saltwater socks. There are a lot of them, and they're very nice. It's been so much fun having you both on Fruity Knitting. There's so many stories here. We could actually sit here for another couple of hours and chat. <laughs> we would. <laughs> But we'll finish off, and I just wanted to ask you a more personal question, and that is you both seem to be really great friends, and together you're extremely successful co-authors. Mm -hmm. So can you just say something about the importance of having a good working relationship and why you think yours is working so well? You know, nothing beats being simpatico to begin with. <sighs> and when I first met Christine, I felt that she had lived the life I had wanted to lead and apparently she thought something similar <laughs> and so uh, we just saw eye to eye we had the same sense of value about the things that we made and we liked making the same we loved the yarn and all of that that worked very well so when it came to writing a book there are a million places you could disagree and we didn't what we actually said was if, if it comes down to an issue we cannot solve then Shirley is in charge of how it reads and Christine is in charge of how it looks. Well done. Mm -hmm. And that's worked really that well. It has worked well, mm -hmm. but we've hardly ever had a conflict. And thinking about it, I realized what happens is I always love what she does and she likes what I do. <laughs> How can you lose? That's perfect. <laughs> and when I, when I had met Shirley initially, uh, we were at a talk with the Craft Council of Newfoundland Labrador, and Shirley had come back from Peru, and she had brought the chulios that the young men knit uh, and I've always been in awe of those young men walking those mountain trails and in chulios at the same time. And I went, I have got to go see this Shirley Ann Scott give her talk. And <laughs> A couple of weeks later, Shirley came to a talk I was giving mm -hmm. on Newfoundland trigger myths, ah, and we struck up this conversation, that and that was it, and we could finish each other's sentences, mm -hmm. and we both knew the value mm -hmm. of having survived Newfoundland yeah. in mm -hmm. the olden days, yeah. and how the modern world may be starting to forget yes. the value of this, and we went... Do you think we could chart all those patterns? Imagine we better we, chart imagine them. Imagine if we could write a book. <laughs> and then, of course, we knew Gavin, and Gavin jumped right on. That's so, our publisher. That's our publisher, <laughs> Boulder Books. So uh, Shirley and I have had so much fun since yes. we met, yes. meeting and laughing. And mm -hmm. the things we've thought of inventing that we haven't even had a chance to do. And then yeah. sometimes I'm way too far out, you know. <laughs> With my uh, imagination. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, she wants recipes in the box. <laughs> that might be a bad idea. <laughs> I'm still waiting to put the Lassie just Tart trigger one, in it. <laughs> yeah, just one little one, sneak it in at the end. Yes, <laughs> yes. I oppose that. 
<laughs> the elastic carrot pattern would have been a hit. <laughs> but that's as far as we've ever gotten, as far as mm-hmm. the disagreement. Yeah. And then we'll yeah. laugh, and then we'll carry mm-hmm. on with these colors so look good. If you're so. simpatico to begin with and have respect for each other's work, then yeah. that's the that's essential. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, so we've always gotten along. Yeah, Definitely. Well, you we both have a laugh. An absolute <laughs> treasure to Newfoundland, and I'm sure that the Newfoundlanders alone worldwide are very, very grateful for your work, and then Thank everybody you. else is very grateful for just being introduced to this culture. <laughs> so, as I said, it's been fantastic to have you on Fruity Knitting. And let's say goodbye to the audience. Oh, let's wait let's now. We've yes, yes, yes. Now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a pro- we're, we're going to give you a proper goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Like to go something, hunting in the fall. Like to go something, answer the hunting call. Got to get me moose, boy. Well, first to get a moose license, you will play for six whole years. At $35 a crack, old man, with a partner for half shares. And when you get the license, cock is area 28. Nowhere near civilization, 300 miles away. But I got to get me moose, boy. Like to go hunting, hunting in the fall. Like to go hunting, answer the hunting call. Got to get me moose, boy. To get you where you're going, it's a Hilton on four wheels. Gets easily stuck in the gas tank, leaks and something up.